Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jeffrey Skutnik. Jeff is the VP of Engineering at Whisker, a company that makes automated cat care products. Jeff, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks. Uh, hi, Spencer. Nice to be here. Good to have you on. I hadn't seen you since I toured your guys' facility a few months back. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff going on at Whisker for sure right now. Since you've been there, we're getting ready to do a lot of the construction on the building because we're growing very quickly. So it's pretty exciting. Badass. Uh, what are you trying to build for? Like, uh, can you talk at all about like kind of some of the new uh, capabilities you're bringing in house or? Yeah. So um, our engineering is our engineering, our marketing, our sales, our IT, um, our, our creative folks, our product are all in 25% of the building we have right now. Um, we kind of did that because at the time of COVID, uh, when we sent everybody home, we paused any kind of build out. And now we're, we're bursting at the seams. Um, engineering is going to take over that 25% of the building, plus a whole new AD section that we're building out with. Um, I think we're tripling our, our fab lab that we're, we're doing, our additive uh, materials lab. And then the other side of the building, the other big chunk of it is turning into a, a really nice marketing C-suite area uh, with with um, IT will be over there. Our product teams will be over there. So it's pretty exciting time at Whisker for sure. That's awesome. It's good to see you guys growing. Uh, as I told you when we sort of first got introduced, I've been a customer of the Litter Robot for over 10 years now. So big fan of your guys' product. Still running an outdated LR2, but I mean, that thing's been a tank just through, through the years. And I mean, the, the you guys other, were always other. good about sending replacement parts and I don't know. Yeah, the, You're doing the, doing the good work. <laughs> LR2 has absolutely been our, been the workhorse um, to start with. LR3 really um, was the turning point for Whisker to, to turn it on. And now that LR4 is out there um, with a lot of the new features in, uh, on our app, in, in particular Smart Scale, which allows you know, the users to identify which pet is using it based on their weight. Now you can start tracking in your, if you have more than one cat in your house, you can start tracking the usage of your pet and know which one's using it. So it's, it's been pretty exciting. Um, we're really happy too as well with LR4, um, the robustness, the, uh, the overall reliability of it um, has been really outstanding. Uh, and I, I just got back from Juno, which is where our factory's at. And um, it's amazing to see where, we have, where we've come from. We started with a small line on LR4 when it launched and now we had two full lines going to a third line, so it's it's really exciting. It's that's really, awesome. And and just a do a little bit of a plug on this too. It's like when we um we had an incredible Black Friday through Saber Monday weekend. It was just just everybody missed it. <laughs> everybody was shocked about um how how I mean uh, if our CEO listens to this, he'll be like, no, I wasn't shocked. I expected it, but um <laughs> there was a, a bit of uh, hey Jacob. Uh, numbers real kind of thing and then it was and it's, it's been awesome that's awesome today's episode of collaborative with spencer kraus is brought to you by whisker and their flagship product the litter robot i did a lot of research and the litter robot is the best self-cleaning litter box on the market today i've been running mine for over 10 years now and seriously i recommend it to all my friends and family with cats i'm not just saying this i've not scooped cat poop in over a decade and the company has stood behind the product, sending me free replacement components whenever anything is broken, and I wasn't even doing ad reads for them back then. The Litter Robots 3 and 4 coming out now are a lot more technologically advanced than the Litter Robot 2 I bought all those years ago. Now you can get your cat's weight, digestive habits, and more, all from their app. And it's one of the few things we still make in America. If you want to buy one, check out litterrobot.spencerkraus.com for $50 off your Litter Robot 3 or 4 purchase. You might get a weird ad block warning, but don't worry about it. I tested it out myself, and it works fine if you just push past it. And now, back to the show. So I guess I'd like to hear about kind of how you got into this role and um, 
I don't know, what, what kind of gets you up in the morning? Um, how'd you get into engineering and technology? Oh boy. You're, you're stretching me back a ways. Um, good. <laughs> so, um, I, I've always been a tinker. I've always liked to, to make things. Um, this is way back before the internet and before cell phones and all that stuff. My buddies and I were always doing everything from like RC cars to our own catapults to whatever it was. We were, oh, that's we were awesome. And stuff. I did ballistas yeah. back in the day. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then, um, really, uh, I, 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 I'm a, I'm a math junkie. I absolutely love math. Um, went in, uh, to college looking for the, 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 which engineering should I go to? Should I go mechanical, electrical, Same here. Should I go physics, um, electrical is the one I, 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 I gravitated toward, um, uh, went all the way through electromagnetics, went through an RF, uh, graduate school, um, in Brooklyn, rock, rock on Brooklyn. Um, it was, it, was Got a it was back in the days too, when Brooklyn, um, the, the university is now, it's now part of NYU, uh, the Tannen school of engineering, but back then it was just straight up Brooklyn poly. And it, it, we had a lot of smart engineers that came through Brooklyn Poly back then. Is that the Industry City location, or is that a different different one? I'm not sure which is what Industry City called, but it's NYU Tannen. It's down um, on Flatbush and J Street, kind of oh, down cool. there, the southern end of Brooklyn. I think it might be my my geography is a little hazy on that area, so I don't want to <laughs> say I know more than I do. I had a buddy that was a lab manager at an NYU location in Brooklyn, so I thought maybe it was to do with the same same facilities i don't know yeah, but, but they, have, they have a lot of they have a lot of real estate so it might not be also yeah that that area has changed so dramatically too i mean when i went there it was kind of a little sketchy um now it's just incredible it's incredible to walk around that area i was just there like a couple weeks ago it was really cool that's awesome and then after that um i ended up um well when i was school going to school in brooklyn i, I worked for the department of defense uh, my first job out of college doing telemetry design, really just monitoring munitions. Um, oh, cool. A guy, a guy like artillery? Work. What's that? I'm picturing artillery telemetry, but I, I don't know. Yeah, basically what I did is I, I was the, the guy that put the equipment on smart munitions in order to monitor everything as the, as the, the products were being developed. That's so, cool. It was cool. I got to spend a lot of time in the desert. Um, <laughs> it was cool. What what self-respecting engineer hasn't blown a few things up though? Like I think that's that's kind of part of the game, as it were. I've blown a few things up, but uh, uh, there was a guy when I was at Motorola um, lit a whole floor on fire. So uh, <laughs> how do you do that? Guy. If I can if I can ask, I think I think it was a lithium battery early early. Or no no no, um, this was still nickel cadmium days. So there was a nickel cadmium fire. So that takes effort. Yeah. I remember the last lipo fire I witnessed um, was at a BattleBots event I was competing in. And um, one of the uh, BattleBots caught fire on the charger. We, um, I guess you're supposed to balance charge the, the cells because sometimes one cell will go right. below or above the charge of the other one. So you get these leads in between. And um, because of the way the BattleBot was set up, the battery had to be charged in the bot and there wasn't room to run the balance charger out or we just didn't or whoever ran that one. It wasn't mine. But it was someone else's. But I think they over discharged a cell. The whole thing caught on fire and I was one of like three people that carried it running out the door and into like a box of cat litter that was outside, <laughs> like dumped more cat litter on it to try to extinguish the lithium fire. We had another one in the field robotics center at Carnegie Mellon. No, it was the planetary robotics high bay at Carnegie Mellon ended up costing the university 30 grand in like HEPA filter replacements. Oh geez. Yeah. Oh, luckily the building didn't burn down, <laughs> but, uh, and these things yeah, happen. That, that, that same job I was at, um, we were doing a um, MLRS is the multi launch rocket system. It looks like that one on the back of a truck that sort of lifts up, twists, and points. Cool. So um, my telemetry device was on one of those those units, and all night long it was on a trickle charge, and then it went out at night cat still, and it went out for the test, big big test day. I'm like 23 years old, 24 years old. There's all these like kernels and stuff that are all out there because <laughs> it's a big test and they have like, one down, star down range um they have uh cameras that are monitoring the stuff so there's a lot of stuff that's going on and this was in las cruces too so they shoot over the highway 
So they have to close the highway for the missile launch. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And as they, they're going down the countdown, they're calling out each one of the subsystems. Is it ready? Go, no, go, go, no, go. And at when we get to that countdown part, I'm supposed to enable the telemetry device because it only those nightcats back then, they were pretty small and they had to last for the flight. So they had to be hot right into and be off right until launch. Wow. So I get to mine and all I have is a current measurement. I can just see a current spike change and it comes to me and I, and they say, and I have to say, no go. I got nothing. I got Riddle. nothing, nothing. So I ended up shutting down this entire launch. for the <laughs> um, Long story short, it wasn't my fault. It was the guy, because I wasn't allowed to near, be near the missile at all. Right. So it was the guy that hooked my ribbon cable up. Ah. They didn't do it well enough. And I had, connectivity that i could see that current was connected but i didn't have my control line connected brutal so, yeah so just a loose but, ribbon cable derailed the entire launch it did it did yeah that's, then, that sort of thing but, happens like so much more often than i think people would admit like like all the time basically yeah i think one of uh, a big takeaway um, if anybody is listening from an engineering standpoint which i think they are i hope so um, yeah you can do everything right and engineering is still going to find new ways to find problems because that's the that's the nature of the beast as you do development i mean good engineering is failing fast and uh, and finding that stuff out and then fixing it moving on anyone who thinks that engineering can be done flawlessly has never done engineering 100 so. percent agree and, and i think like you know when you see these horrible accidents that occur oftentimes to me i mean that's the result of hubris somebody didn't want to say you know no go and, right. you know, as a result, you know, people die or like equipment gets damaged and, and you have these horrible disasters. So, I mean, just the fact that you had the fortitude to do that, I think, speaks to your, you know, character as a human and as an engineer. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And then so then just a real quick, I'll breeze through my uh, my history after <clears throat> I'm from I'm from Michigan. I wanted to move back to Michigan. All this I was living out in Jersey at the time and um, had an opportunity to work for Motorola. So came back to the Midwest. Um, it was probably the coolest, longest period of engineering I had. Motorola, when it, when I was there, I worked for the mobile division. The, the Back then it was called cellular. <laughs> I, I, that was supposed to be a joke, but um, yeah, no one calls them cellular anymore. Yeah, I guess they do. But anyway. Um, I still say cell phone. <laughs> still say cell phone. Yeah, the, um, it was a great place to be. They, they, the, the, men, the senior engineers there really mentored people really well. There was a culture of uh, not just accountability, but teaching that went into it. Um, awesome. Design reviews back then were brutal. Um, when you went into a design review, you know you needed to have your shit together, right? Because <laughs> um, you're, you're going to stand up in front of guys that are 30 years, you know, gold badges, which is, at Motorola which means you had more than 10 patents. Wow. Um, to do a design review back then was was some was good stuff. It, you learned a lot. You, you had to know your shit to be in front of that kind of group. So that was fun. It was um, great experience. Um, Motorola went through some changes, right? So and then um, I had a, a great opportunity to move over to Rim. Uh, myself and a couple other guys started a design center in Chicago. So we grew it from zero to eventually the the whole design center was three hundred. Now they weren't all. Badass my team um i had the basically the electrical mechanical engineers at that time and there was a good software contingent um, a lot of great folks in the chicago blackberry center um, which, which was pretty exciting we did a lot of good phones there um early curves some of the bulls it's back blackberry days if those of you who remember blackberry is that the one with the curved bottom yeah yeah those were cool what about the Google phone you worked on? Uh, I believe it was Project Tango, I want to say, if I'm remembering that Ara. right. Project Ara. Project oh, sorry. Ara. Project Ara. My, my bad. Yeah, so that happened um, after. Sorry, Astro. Yeah. So BlackBerry um, was exiting uh, doing the phone development. And uh, a company called Wistron, who is a CM for BlackBerry, bought our entire design center. And we did some BlackBerry stuff for a while, but I, was, I had the good fortune of knowing a couple of people at Google and be going out there. And I also wanted to prove to people at, at Wistron at the time, modular phones are difficult. Um, <laughs> and and the, the Google um, ATAP team that was uh, doing their advanced development out there was working on Ara for a while. And it just happened to be the right time, uh, right place, right time. And we had a good design team. 
that could do the work. We work with the ATAP team. Um, and it was it was super cool project. So uh, ATAP yeah. stands for people listening for advanced technology and projects. How deep were you integrated into ATAP for that project? Well, ATAP in and of itself, um, I, I, that we were there for the one program for probably about a year to 16 months. Cool. As part of that program. Um, ATAP was a small team, actually, and they used a lot of third parties to do the work for them. So they had a core team. Uh, Rafa Camargo uh, was running at a time. I think he's at Meta now working on. I don't know what he's working on, but I think he's at Meta now. They've got a few interesting uh, initiatives right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, we were there w- within about 16 months. There was other teams that were working with us as well. The 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 core, for those of you who don't know what ARA is, it was a complete modular phone where the, the, the exoskeleton itself, the entire body of the phone housed um, like a, a PCIe bus a circuit by Toshiba that was able to connect to all the modules and all the modules could plug in, plug and play live on the, on the device. So if you wanted to have three batteries, you could put three batteries. If you wanted to put a new display on, you could put a new display on. If you wanted to have six speakers on the thing, you could do six speakers. <laughs> and the ATAP program, so we were the ones doing the, the the main body of it. They work with multiple vendors on all the modules too. So there was, I don't remember off the top of my head now, but multiple vendors that were doing those unique designs around, again, like speakers. And there was even one that, uh, Tardigrades. I don't know if you know what tardigrades are. Water I do know birds. about tardigrades. Yeah, these are the like the little insecty things that can survive in space, right? Yeah, they can survive anything. So there was mm-hmm. one group that was making a tardigrade module that had a little magnifying glass on it. So if you wanted to watch your pet tardigrade um, uh, on your phone, you could. That's hilarious. We were we were, we were successful with that. Um, then at the time, Google was doing that because the Apple was dominating the app space. And, and starting to dominate in the iOS space. Um, Samsung was obviously using Android, but Google wanted to be in the hardware space to, to kind of lock down Android. Um, and, and anyone who's working for Google now, excuse me if I'm screwing up the, 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 the kind of the strategy there, but that's what was told to us at the time. Um, and we got pretty far, but it was also, if you think about it from an engineering standpoint, if you have a module on a product, you all of a sudden you have a double wall that you add to it. So thickness became a quite an issue. So functionally everything was good. Um, there was a change at Google that says that we wanted to move directly. That's kind of like the genesis of the time frame where they started thinking about pixel phones. Yeah. So they decided to go directly to a smartphone and they they cut R at that time. There, there was a if you look on YouTube, you it might still be out there. There was a commercial for it early on that showed people swapping in and out modules. Um, and what was supposed to take place with the with the version that we had, which was the version one, was really all about getting a, a, a platform out there for the modular developers to work on and grow and grow with. And then the plan from a commercialization point at Google was to go to their V2, which to make it sexy and slim and everything. But again, at sense. Google, they changed their 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 strategy going forward. Yeah, uh, yeah. you'll you'll have that, unfortunately. Yeah, so um, my time there at Wistron, which we we did that, um, we also worked with a bunch of other other groups, other other third parties. We did stuff for Whirlpool and Honeywell and all that stuff. A lot of good stuff. Cool. And then um, I want. I'm from Michigan. I was living in Chicago. We wanted to move back to see family, so moved back here and decided to jump into the automotive space. Worked for Vistion for a good chunk of my time. Um, and anyone who's listening to this knows how painful during COVID the part shortage was and working in the automotive space during the part shortage was grueling to say the least. Uh, a lot of incredible team members I had all, all across the globe that really kind of stepped up because almost every single every single product that was in market needed to be re- redesigned. So to make sure that we couldn't, we didn't shut down. I mean, you don't want to shut down the, the Ford line, right? Or you don't want to shut down BMW. Yeah, so a lot of good work there. Uh, and then I had the luck uh, at the time. I was uh, not really looking, but kind of looking, kind of hinting around, seeing what's out there and had the opportunity to go over to Whisker. And it's been incredible. Uh, in Michigan, there's 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 pockets of startup. There's a lot of great stuff that happened in the mobility space, smaller companies and such. Um, a couple other small startups. Uh, Whisker is one of those. It's part of the kind of the, 
it's a long company. Brad Baxter founded this thing, I think it was like 23, 24 years ago. Um, really by through pure tenacity, was able to keep that thing growing and building and he did everything to get it started and, and then created a foundation that we could build on. Um, what's interesting about Whisker now is it's in this transition point from being a product that is outstanding, that serves a, you know, solves a problem for our pet parents, cleans the litter, cats are happy, to moving to a space of pet wellness where we're letting our pet parents have insights into their day-to-day -day life with their pets. Think about it as what Whisker's mission really is, is, is to create kind of a smart ecosystem that gives you all that information so you can have a happy, healthy relationship with your pet. So I can't talk about it here, but there's a lot of great things on our roadmap coming that's really going to add across that so we can really get a full picture awesome. of what your pet does in, in a day. That's really cool. Definitely excited to see what's coming next. Uh, uh, should be some fun developments there. Yeah, like I said, I, I can't really, I can't talk about it well, right now. All good. No, no, no. I was more just saying that kind of as a open-ended, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like looking forward to it. But um, yeah, no, what I will say is my uh, my Little Robot 2 does none of that. But what I love about <laughs> it is I haven't had to scoop cat feces for like 10 years now. So just not having shit on my hands at the end of the day is worth every penny I paid for it in grad school when I couldn't really afford it. <laughs> so I justified it originally. I was like, you know, if I pay a cat sitter 20 bucks a day to be here and this allows me to not hire a cat sitter because I don't have the litter box overrunning and poop all over the place, like it's worth it from that alone. And so that's how I, how I justified it in my head. And I'm so glad I did because it's, it's one of the best things I ever but bought for the bang for the buck. Since I've been here, um, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of customers um, and, and learn from them and, you know, help them on, on some of the, with their troubleshooting issues and stuff like that. It's really good to get in on that stuff. But also the the positive feedback we get on a lot of the things. There was a guy I was at, I'd only been with Whisker, I think about four months and I was at, no, maybe about five months. I was at CES a couple of years ago. And a guy walked up to, to the Whisker booth and he, he looked me right in the eye and he said, you saved my marriage. <laughs> That's awesome. He said, yeah, my wife loves her cats and she was always upset with me that I wasn't scooping and we fought about it and fought about it. And we got this thing. Our lives are, are completely solved around this now. It's fantastic. Um, that, that's that, that aspect of it to your point too, about not having a scoop, but we also have stories, real stories of where the litter box, the information that, that that's fed back in the app. If all of a sudden we had one pet parent that said, all of a sudden I see that my cat's using it so much more often, took it to the vet and caught a UTI early. Oh, so wow. That saved my pet's life. Another one was like, after we released LR4, which weighed the cat, the person was, you know, you get tech, you get kind of obsessed, you start watching it. <laughs> she she responded back to us, says, I saw my pet's weight dropping pretty quickly. I went to the vet. We found out there was like this uh, irritable bowel syndrome that was going on, and we, we were able to address that. That's awesome. And these are the things that Whisker, I can talk about, that Whisker is going to be doing, where we're going to be building into our algorithms and our notifications, like a regular use or changes of behavior. So we can like we can give our, our pet parents more information. Again, our goal is not just pet health, but pet wellness. So... A lot of that's a lot of that's coming in, and then as we broaden out the portfolio, there's other things that we can provide. So awesome, that's really cool, and um, yeah, I definitely appreciate you making the time to come on here. Is there yeah. anything you want to talk about or plug, kind of while we're on our way out here? Uh, well, one thing I love to plug: if there's any engineers listening to this that want a job and love to work in Michigan, reach out to me directly. You can get me at Jay Whisker, uh, J, sorry, Jay Scutnick at Whisker.com, and um, we are growing um, since I've been there. Uh, I'm about 15, 20 engineers to easily 70. And we see positive growth next year. And we're looking for strong double E's, strong mechanical engineers, a strong cloud uh, software engineers that are, are, are good in AWS and anybody in data science and machine learning. So that's my plug. We're recruiting. We'd love to have you come. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Jeff. I really appreciate it. 
Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, for yeah, Spencer. if you want a cool job at a company doing innovative stuff, get a hold of Jeff. Sounds great. Thanks, Spencer. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.